Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. We are at GearFest 2014, and we are joined by Emil Worsler. Thanks for coming in, man. No problem, man. Appreciate you being here. Oh, love it. Guitarist for Doth and uh, Chimera, mm -hmm. and uh, virtuoso player, and you're here on behalf of, uh, of a PRS. Yeah. And we're, we're happy to have you here. I'm, I'm stoked to be here. It's always a good time, right? Thanks for coming in, yeah. No problem. Yeah, it really is. Can you believe the crowds? I, I had no idea this place was that big. I keep saying it. I'm just, I get lost like every five minutes. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, well. Yeah, we've got maps now they put up, so you <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. find your way around when you need to. <laughs> So I've, I've seen you play many, many times at the PRS Experience. You're, you're a big PRS guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that's always stood out is you just have phenomenal technique, but also your command of different musical styles mm. is really very impressive. You know, a lot of people will focus on just getting one, but you're doing jazz, you're doing metal stuff, you've got yeah. a lot of different things that you're doing. How did you kind of evolve that whole approach? Well, um, actually, I, I was asked that question earlier today. I um, My goal, you know, a lot of times when you look at, I guess when you're around the age of, 16 or 17 when things have to get more serious when you have to really kind of make a decision like what do I want to do with myself mm -hmm. uh, I was really into art and I was really into music But art was I felt like it was second best. I really evaluated like, you know, what was I gonna do? I knew I was gonna go to college, but do I want to go pursue art or do I want to go pursue pursue music and most people say Well, if I go pursue something I love it'll ruin it, you know mm -hmm. So when I was young and, and kind of not out in the real world yet And I was thinking do I really want to do guitar because I really do love it um Lo and behold, I chose guitar because I, I decided to do it uh, based on the fact that if I could think it, I could do it, whereas art, I would have to manipulate my way into doing something awesome. Mm -hmm. But I was more free with the instrument. So fast forward to um, around the age of, like a college age, like 18, 19, I decided to go to school uh, because I couldn't play jazz. I could mimic it. Okay. Um, and anything that had distortion, overdrive, tapping, slapping, 20, I mean, that was me. I was that guy, 24-7. Right. But uh, what I couldn't do was control my harmony like a jazz player. And mm -hmm. that bothered me. I felt left out. So what I decided to do, uh, you know, I think the universal question for human beings in general is what do you want? And that's a question that's hard because nobody can really answer that. The people that can get the closest to answering that question are usually people that are brilliant. Mm -hmm. Because they, they, there's no... Uh, there's nothing, there's not a wall they can't run through to get what they want. They're usually sure. kind of crazy people too, you know, <laughs> artist types and stuff like that. Right. Anyways, my goal, uh, I decided to, to do guitar and do it seriously. And my goal was to make a living with this instrument, no matter what came my way. Mm -hmm. And considering that opportunity comes in every shape and form, the last thing I wanted to do was lock myself down to one style to where if I got a phone call that could change my life, I'd have to get nervous and say no, because I wasn't capable of doing it. That would suck. Mm -hmm. right. So I decided that I needed to uh, create a style and dedicate myself to it that uh, and find out how not just creating my own style but find out how the instrument works mm -hmm. and even go this the the scholastic route as well as going um, just the street smart way of just jamming and fi oh that works I don't care why it works it sounds good I'm gonna remember that these kinds of things right and then uh, the two came together and um, it wound up being kind of a, a bluesy kind of gypsy jazz thing and then when the when the Doth came along. I was an instructor at a place called Elite Music Sales in Montgomery, Alabama, and we sold PRS guitars. That's how I fell in love. Mm -hmm. um, I left that when we got signed to Roadrunner in like 07. And okay. uh, then all of it started. And it just so happens that the way that we wrote the stuff, I couldn't freely play over it like a progression, like a 1625 or a 145 or a blues. Mm -hmm. that, that attracted me because I, it was frustrating. I saw it as a challenge. So late at night when we weren't writing, I would go home and go, I need to find a way to play through this stuff and make up like my own pentatonic box. Okay. You know, the comfort, the comfortable Jimmy Page, like it's always that box. It's like that one or the other one. All the in-between, some guys may use it, but you're not gonna, you know, Black Dog is in that box, so it's comfortable. <laughs> right. Since we relate things to being comfortable, I wanted to find something that I could use as a platform and a style. And it wound up being diminished, it wound up being minor six, it wound up being these things that actually or gypsy jazz uh, tones. Okay. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing until I started getting into Django. I started getting back into the gypsy jazz guys, and then people would point out, you know, eventually I'd go play in France, which that's where Borelli Lagrine is from, mm -hmm. and people in the audience would be like, you, you know, you sound like Borelli, and I'm like, no way. And you heard that? They're like, yes, diminished. I'm like, mm. So the idea right. was to use the diminished ideas and not sound like Ingve, which no offense to Ingve, I love Ingve, but I didn't want to sound like something that had been done before by somebody who's the best at it, obviously. I wanted to tread new territory. Sure. 
So back to the question, to answer the question, um, the, I guess being able to play multiple styles was the only choice that I had to be involved with the music because I'm from a small town that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. There's nobody to play with. It's everybody's story, right? And uh, so I made sure I was well prepared. And if a blues guy came my way, I was going with him. If a metal guy came my way, I was going with him. It just so happens that I had a natural ability for metal because I can't shut up. I'm high strong. I, I can't sit still. And <laughs> there you have it. Got the energy. <laughs> Got the, the energy. energy that drives it. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's interesting then. So you, you've studied the jazz harmony and, and obviously that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The question is then, you, you had said you're not playing over standard progressions. I mean, if normally if you have a 1-4-5, a lot of guys will just, if you're in A, you'll play the A blues scale over yeah. the 1-4-5. Are you thinking then, as you see these different chords fly by you in different riffs, are you thinking chord by chord, or are you looking mm -hmm. for a scale that'll tie all Great those chords question. together? That, that's, and, and yeah, that's the answer right there, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I teach a lot, and uh, and when people ask me questions, and even in clinics when they ask questions, I can almost tell they're gonna ask it before they ask it because we're all human beings and we all right. have the same emotions. And I know for a fact that the F chord is the last chord you learned out of those basic chords because it was the, hardest, the hardest one. I mean, sure. you know, so like when these little kids come in and I teach them, I'm like, learn the F chord, learn the F chord. You didn't learn the F chord. I know you didn't, why do I know? Because I didn't learn the F chord. <laughs> right. It sucks, the F chord's right. terrible. Right. Hurts your hand, <laughs> <They're right. trained. laughs> so um, it is frustrating, I, I do, um, Whenever I get a chance to have something relative, like a scale that can address everything, I'll use it if I have to. But for the most part, yeah, I, I take the hard road. I, I do it per chord. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you can find relative things, but um, it's more, my style is more of a, uh, kind of the way that a guy like um, uh, Scott Henderson would look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he would come to AIM in Atlanta and do clinics, and I would uh, actually have the library guy like sneak me his little handouts because he would say things like, play diminished off the major third if it's a dominant chord. Mm -hmm. And that, that seeing it like that and hearing it like that made me go, well, that's how he looks at it. He sounds awesome. I'm going to look at it like that. So then fast forward, you mix that with the Gypsy Jazz stuff. And um, now I basically impose chords over progressions. So now if there is a progression, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find me imposing the five where it doesn't belong, you know, over the one. Because when you play, when you play rock, there's no third in a bar chord, so sure. you have all kinds of freedom. Mm -hmm. It almost becomes a challenge to figure out what to play because you know too much sure. stuff. There's no tonality really to it. Yeah, so per chord definitely, but when I get a chance, um, I try to always, well, I try to not lose sight of the other things that work, like the pentatonic box and just having, a, being able to play something simple and just make it sound good. Right, You know. right. Now, without going off into the music theory weeds, mm -hmm. when you say you impose the five chord on top of that, are you looking at that five chord as extensions to that one chord? Or yeah. are you just looking at it as a tonality that you can bring to it. I'm looking. I'm looking at it as in it's getting uglier, and then I can control when I when I bring it back into to pretty land. Uh huh. So I can create the tension, create the tension, create the tension, and then as soon as the drummer is done with his fill, or as soon as that one comes back around, it's bang right on the money. Uh, and it's usually something more. I usually resolve it with the blues. Okay. I'm a big Jimmy Herring fan. Sure. And I am from the South, so that's kind of how we do it. It's like get ugly, get nasty, get gnarly. Play the blues. As long as you bring it back to the Black, tonality, back to the blues. Yeah, bring it. Out and, yeah, go to yeah. Mars, come back to Earth. But right. when you land on Earth, land land in the bluegrass, land in the South. You know. Right, right. <laughs> now, one of the guys, or one of the things that I hear guys talk about with that is that it's a challenge for them to improvise, given how fast the chords are flying by, mm. because they can't think of the scales fast enough and the chords. Is yeah. that something that you work on in advance, or can you truly improvise in that in that uh, mode? It. There's a few things uh, that that's always on my mind. And it is hard. Mm -hmm. And even guys like Pat Martino, there is a bit of, um, you know, he, he controls his passing tones. So right. it's almost like in a way you wind up simplifying and instead of going, I'm going to do exactly this there, I'm going to play the flat nine on this dominant. But instead of saying all that, you wind up going, I'm going to sound uglier and more tense because I know in eight bars that A minor is coming back around and I know how to play over that. So you wind up doing that for long enough and your ear develops to where you can catch stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're kind of looking for targets. You're looking for targets, yeah. And also, I'm a big boxing fan, and uh, because of the psychological side of it, you can get a guy that weighs 30 pounds less than somebody who can outsmart him with defense, and they'll win. Mm -hmm. The guy will defeat himself. You know what I'm saying? Right. So uh, with the guitar, it's the same thing. It, if I'm comfortable and I'm relaxed and I'm playing with the right people, I'm confident that I can go up and I'm loose enough, I can go up on stage in front of people and play a standard that I've never played before or worked on and sound and get by it and maybe even turn some heads. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you were to put me in front of that, that paper and I learned it and worked on it, I would probably be trying so hard to get through it that I would be uncomfortable and that would show 
um, you know, with the, with, with the sound, you would hear me being tense and stuff like that. So right. it, it's, it's a very challenging way to do it. Um, but the idea is to, to mix it well and to know when to pull it out. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's, it's very tough, and you, you really nailed it. On my mind when I practice is I have to work double, triple, you know, triple just the amount of, of effort to, to be able to play through each chord because it's just really hard. Right. You know, like, and you see a jazz standard with, like, four chords per measure, that's, like, one count per chord. Yeah, right. So, yeah, can but, you really follow all those chords? Yeah, but there's, but there's also, there's also um, uh, analyzation. You know, I was also taught by a gentleman named Trey Wright out of Atlanta, um, and... There, there. You know, if you see a two five one, that's a diatonic. You know, a lot of times we just see these chords, and you can relate it to something, right? Or a substitute. A lot of these substitutions that you think is just a random chord that's unrelated is actually very much a tritone sub, and you can actually just play a dominant arpeggio over that. But then again, boom, there's another chord, and you're like, you don't want to get lost. So, right. There's a sense of sometimes I'll sit down with friends or by myself, and I'll improvise with no key. And mm -hmm. if you relax enough and you play free, nothing you've ever practiced, you can't play the Jimmy Page. Like you have to play complete random notes and you have to play them like you mean them, like you're in front of 5,000 people. If you do that for half an hour a day, mm -hmm. you start to get really comfortable with the fact because a wrong note's not a wrong note until you show everybody it's a mistake. A wrong note's not a wrong note, you know, until you go, oops, and you, and you, you fudge it. You, you, make go, a face, oh, right? you make a face. But really, to be honest, the best musicians in the world it's the mistakes and how they recover from those mistakes that make them incredible, like Sean Lane. Mm -hmm. Like, I've never heard him play a mistake because if he plays a note that's not diatonic to the key, the next note is, is perfect. And look, that was tension and release. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of a psychological dance, I guess. And, right. uh, and it's, it's all about conviction because, and, and playing with rhythm. Because if I play wrong notes in rhythm, who's to say they're wrong? If I play wrong sure. notes and I look at some kid in the audience and go, yeah, I meant to do that. Who's to say it was wrong? I tell right. myself that at least. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So the, the other side of the coin is the technique to pull these things off. Mm -hmm. And obviously you have awesome technique. Thank you. Did you do specific exercises to develop the right hand mm -hmm. speed and things yeah. to, to uh, work on that? I never really worked with a metronome. Um, I'm, I'm not a very um, organized, I kind of, I, I, I'm a squeaky wheel gets the grease guy, I always have been, and that's kind of why most normal people could probably see me as a bit of a space cadet. But when it comes down to the guitar and, uh, and, and working on technique, um, to be flat out honest with you, it was just something that I'm lucky that I started earlier enough to where I can get obsessive where life hadn't kicked in yet. Right. I took my guitar to school, I straight up ignored the teachers. I made just enough, just enough of good grades to keep my parents off my back so I could keep playing guitar. Mm -hmm. I knew, I kind of knew that I was going to do it and I knew that when I played, people listened and that was a sign, right? So it's, it's uh, with technique, I was obsessive like young people are. We're so serious at that age of 14, 15 that we, we want to overdo it because we want to show ourselves and everybody around us that we're, we're serious about it, you know? Right. And that's when people are born of, uh, of incredible technique. There's, you know, there's very few on, and on the planet that truly have a musical soul with technique to complement it. And those are the scariest ones. Jimmy Rosenberg, Django Reinhardt, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Dimebag Daryl, guys like that. It's right. like those guys can give you the goosebumps and then they can just make you want to quit too because they're so damn good, you know? Right. So uh, technique, I was lucky. I caught it early. I was obsessive. And again, I, I was kind of, I'm a high strung dude. Mm -hmm. I'm getting older, so it's not the same. But when I was younger, it was like, ah, everything was 100 miles an hour, you know? <laughs> right. And um, I was serious. I was from a small town and I didn't know any better. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to play at a million miles an hour. I didn't know that. You know, I was obsessed with just not making mistakes. I didn't know that mistakes are what you make of them. Right. You know, so I think to answer your question, the technique comes from, I've been playing for a long time and I wasn't concerned about harmony at first and melody. I was concerned about being a badass. Mm -hmm. So enough years of that and I had enough technique for a lifetime. I don't practice technique anymore. Mm -hmm. I do worry about the psychological side of stuff. I will, like I came here early today because um, I didn't bring my guitar with me and I, and I had a foreign guitar I had to play so I needed to make sure I was properly warmed up sure. because it's all about being relaxed. Mm -hmm. You know. That's the key to being able to do that that quickly. Yeah, you'd be surprised. People think that you're supposed to like grind your teeth and, and, and I do play really hard but you know what? I play harder when I'm relaxed. I pop those strings because you're in rhythm. You're not forcing anything. That's technique. Mm -hmm. Mike Phelps is probably a lot more relaxed than you think he is when he's just killing it in the swimming pool or whatever he's doing. You know what I mean? Like, right, right. So that, that's kind of the technical side of things. I do believe in relaxing and um, being really focused because it, all it takes is getting to the gig late and you're going to have a gig because you're, you're, you know, you're definitely kind of 
It puts your mind out. You're stressed space, out, right? and you yeah. know, and you're you're worried about finding some cable, and you're not even warming up. You know, so there's a mm -hmm. sense of you have to shut the whole world out. And I'm glad right. that I, I knew what I wanted to do when I was younger because the older you get, the harder it is to do that. It's inexcusable at some point, right? <laughs> <laughs> so something like that. But you put all that work in and then you just kind of have to maintain. At yeah. At that point, you get to a you point where and, and also I noticed that my peers, there's a lot of my peers that uh, the faster players uh, are like athletes. They eventually deteriorate. Your body deteriorates. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of players that are super fast that later in life they lose it and they kind of just sound bad because they don't adapt to themselves. They don't adapt to to um, what's going to naturally happen to you and, and right. with nature taking its course, you know. Uh, so I'm always worried about tomorrow really is the kind of person I am. And I know that if you have a truly musical soul, you can adapt and do anything. If your mm -hmm. body slows down, look at Django Reinhardt, he had two fingers. Right. You know, look at that, look at the way he adapted. So to me, there's no excuse. You should, you should always reinvent yourself, but that's just another conversation about uh, people being pleased with where they're at. Mm -hmm. and not having to reinvent themselves constantly. And that's, that's something that I have no choice to do because I'm a cult guitarist. I've never had a band to sell a million records where I could just sit back, and sip on a martini and right. take a private jet. I gotta fight for it. Mm -hmm. I gotta get nasty about it too. I, gotta, like, I basically have to go shake people down for work and that's, that's what I've accepted and I'm fine with that mm -hmm. because uh, I know for a fact that I'm pretty serious about it and that's the proof right there. Yeah, yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> so speaking of that, mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting that with Chimera, didn't you actually start as a bass player? Yeah. How did that happen? Um, I was in a band, uh, band's still around, we're still around, Doth, and um, we opened for Everybody Under the Sun, and uh, we opened for, actually our drummer in that band used to be in Chimera. So the metal community is a very small uh, cookie jar, mm -hmm. right? So you gotta ha make sure you maintain good relationships with people because you're gonna be working with them again, right? Sometimes, it's just yeah. that, just that's <laughs> the music business in general, right? Yeah, so, so, so be nice, be nice to people. Yeah, right. yeah. But, uh, uh, he left Chimera and came to us, right? We picked him up, and then um, we tore, we opened for Chimera. And at the time, they were going through lineup changes because, I mean, it, it's this was two thousand and nine, uh, and you know when you get to be of age and you want to have a solid life, uh, it's natural to, to to you know say goodbye, close the door, and move on. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens around the age of thirty uh, for most people because there's a lot of people out there in the business that. They're not trying to be the best. They're trying to do their thing. They, they don't, you know what I'm saying? It's like, mm -hmm. that's what they do. If you take that away, they are nothing. That's something else I've always, in my mind, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, be able to do anything or figure it out because you don't want to be one of those people that was in an amazing band, but then that band ends, so you end. Mm -hmm. To survive, I have to keep reinventing myself. So um, the opportunity came. I filled in for a guitar. Um, I got a lot of work with bands like Unearth, Chimera. Uh, and the reputation of filling in on guitar for people that had kids. They, uh, Buzz McGrath from Unearth adopted a child in Kazakhstan, I believe. And uh, so I filled in for him. Mm -hmm. And it's cool because I look at his daughter and I know how long I've known him because she was a little baby when he got her. And now she's, right. I'm like, I've known him, you know, the older she gets, that's how long I've known him. So it's cool. Yeah. And uh, Matt DeVries, the uh, bass player in Fear Factory now, was a guitar in Chimera. And uh, he was having a child. Um, and they, we were in Europe. And what I would do is I would, my band would come along, Doth, opening the show, and I was already there. So then I'd come back out on the stage and play for the headlining band, mm -hmm. which was good for me because if you go to Europe, you're going to get on an airplane and fly across the world. I mean, I want, I want to work. I don't want to sit there. Right. So uh, that happened. It went well. Um, I, I enjoy eating the stress for people that never, have never been through that. I like to make them feel comfortable and know that this guy has your back. He's not going to mess you up, you know, kind of thing. Um, and then, lo and behold, the bass player gets married and his honeymoon smack on a tour and they're like, you play bass? And I'm like, no. Like, yeah, you do. Not you want to you you play, play bass for the Christmas show and this and that? I'm like, yeah, why not? It sounds fun. And then uh, he wound up leaving the band. Uh, sooner or later, he left the band and he had a change in life and, and decided to move on. And uh, the spot was open, so I took it because I, at the time I didn't really have much going on, and I just wanted to get back out there. And uh, and then soon enough, more people left the band, uh, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I'm a guitar player. You moved up a guitar. I'm right? a guitar player. I'm not, not a bass moved, player. Shouldn't say moved. Well, tonally, you moved up. Yeah. Oh, trust me, I moved <laughs> back up the guitar. You don't want to hear me play. Right. You'd much rather hear somebody else play bass. Trust me. I think I think I was I was uh, the, the, our sound guy would get mad because I had it over my head, throwing it around more than because you know you're playing like <laughs> one note. So right. I was right. focused on the performance, you know. But. Yeah. So right. that, that's how it worked out, yeah. Right. Well, that's cool, that's yeah. cool. So you really have two bands kind of going. Yeah, one, one is, uh, one's the priority and active, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is Chimera, we're probably going into the studio uh, later this year. 
Um, the last record we charted at 52, which is a great uh, feat for a metal band, mm -hmm. especially with a complete lineup change. But I think that this is 2014, so I mean, people, you have to do some crazy stuff for people to pay attention to you, so, you right. know. Uh, but the other, other stuff will come later, but as of now, it's a solo record that's not metal at all <laughs> um, as a calling card for the future. Sure. Right? And then uh, Chimera, which is my A thing right now. And then uh, sooner or later, you get Levy Wurstler and Doff and all the other stuff that comes with it, right? Right, right. Lots of projects. Yeah. Y'all, you got really... to stay busy. Yeah. The only security is busyness. Right. You know? Right. <laughs> so let's talk about your guitar. Sure. You're holding a uh, hollow body PRS here. What drew you to PRS? And, and I've actually seen you predominantly playing hollow yeah. bodies, correct? That's yeah. a little strange for the metal world. I play, I, yeah, I play solid bodies um, for uh, the obvious reasons of if it's a tour and we don't have a uh, there's, and there's no monitors or I don't know the conditions I'll hold off, I'll always have one with me on mm -hmm. the bus, but I hold off on using this live uh, because the kind of style that Chimera is there's a lot of stops and a lot of starts lots of dead air dead air stops to where the whole band you can hear a pin drop you know right um, so uh, I usually use solid bodies in that scenario however me myself this is me. Mm -hmm. um, at Elite Music Sales that place in Montgomery, which was a PRS dealer. My close friend Brian's father uh, bought this Spruce hollow top, the Spruce McCarty, with no birds. And um, my first guitar, my first real USA guitar was uh, uh, a USA Custom this or that with sharp two thin lays and Wizards and Warriors. It's actually, it actually popped back up on the internet and yeah. for sale and, I, and people were like, I heard this was yours and yeah, I got kind of shamed, you know, like, but I always, uh, I went to school and I had this guitar and I was going to paint it and I never got around to painting it, of course, because it was just this terrible, like a wizard down here and a cloud right here, a dragon flying around. I mean, I, I was just like, that was humiliating. It's weird, right? That I was actually playing this guitar and people would judge me like, like, oh, look at the metal guy. Here he comes, you know, and I hated that. And I wanted to be right. the kind, I, I thought the smartest thing to do is to be to play a guitar that, this is strange, it simultaneously it simultaneously took people by surprise once they heard you, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they couldn't put their finger on what you were about because you're playing a guitar that doesn't really have the identity of a Wizards and Warriors paint job or a Telecaster for country. This, the, uh, the PRS guitars are newer guitars, and I, that's why I'm into them, because I do love the older guitars, mm -hmm. but uh, I feel there's a sense of being locked down by their own tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, PRS speaks to me because they're constantly trying to reinvent themselves. They're constantly obsessing about some mundane detail. That's me, right. you know. So I bought uh, the guitar off his dad because it sat in the closet, and uh, he. I came. The guy knows me like 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 a kid. I mean, he knows, he knows me perfectly. He said, "Go back there. Go look in that case. You don't have to pay for it. Just take it home. We'll settle up later." Mm -hmm. What? You know, go back there and look in the case. You're gonna want it. You can take it home. All right. Go back there, popped it open, didn't even play it, shut the case, locked it up, threw it in the car, went home. Like, that was it. I was, uh, this same guitar, but with a spruce top, with no, no birds, nothing. Mm -hmm. That guitar um, is the guitar that got me the endorsement with PRS because we had Ausfest with Doth. And I had a standard 22 that went through, that I bought used, that went through a bunch of owners. And uh, the frets were played off of it. And I, would, I was going up to, like, you know, guitar techs and being like, can you help me? Like, I feel like I can't play guitar anymore. Am I crazy, or is there something wrong on my guitar? Look at these, and of course, you know, they look. They take a look at the frets and go, like, what happened? Like, did you just sand them off? And I'm like, no, like they just got played off. Um, so I had to play the hollow, but I had to bite the bullet. Mm -hmm. It was my main guitar, but I was still hesitant to to do that. Right. But then when I did it, it was like, there I, I it's like this. People loved it, and that it's like you. I felt like they loved me because that's what I was. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's like, I, at that point, I went with it. Right. And uh, about halfway through the tour, I got an email from Wing Krozak, uh, who I'm still very, very close with. And uh, it was one of these, I know who you are, we know who you are, we've been watching you. And at first I was like, oh God, why? <laughs> you know, like, and then he was just like, tell me when you're free, I'm gonna get you a plane ticket, you're coming up, you know, you're coming up and we gotta talk about stuff. You know, and I'm not talking about guitars, I'm like, perfect. So I go up there and it was literally like a fairy tale. A uh, kid from a small town um, walking into the factory, and and people, it, it was cool because I'm a southern dude, so I, you know, we usually have packs of people that we know the rest of our lives. PRS, the whole factory from top to bottom, is very much like that. Mm -hmm. I still talk to the people that sand my guitars. I right. mean, you know what I'm saying? Even even the drivers that drive me around to the factory, I got them on my cell phone. I still talk to them. You know, that's awesome. And uh, so. That, the hollow body, uh, I, I didn't know any better. I thought you were supposed to play the hollow body in heavy metal. I did, kind of didn't have a choice too, but then I saw Mark, Mark Isinger from Incubus when I was a kid, and he had a big arch top, and I was that's the baddest thing ever, I want one. 
Right. And then I finally got one and I didn't know any better. And then next thing you know, the whole company is like, you can't, who, nobody's done, like, why are you doing that? Like, we didn't even know, we, who, what, where, when, why, how? And, <laughs> right. and then I started doing clinics and it was kind of the funny thing. Like, look at this, look at this dude play a hollow body and, and play death metal on a hollow body. Isn't it funny? You know? Right. And um, that's pretty much it, man. It became uh, my thing that I really enjoyed. It, it, it definitely became kind of home for me. Mm -hmm. And then I found out they can put tremolos on them and then it just happened all over again. And it's just like, it's even more me, right? So right. I think it's all about, it's all about, um, you know, you have to adapt a lot in music, right? And a lot of times you'll find yourself playing something that you don't want to play, whether it's an amp or a guitar or mm -hmm. whether it's a photo shoot or whatever, whatever the case may be. At video interview. A video, yeah, video, I'm out of here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but this, you know, this, this guitar, um, it gives me everything I need. People can't, predict what style I play. Um, it sounds a little airy and different on records. Mm -hmm. um, it's light, it's beautiful, it looks like a violin. Yeah. And it's so funny, we were walking down the hall with this guitar and people were just like, look at that hollow body. And I'm like, yeah, look at that hollow body. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, you yeah. know. I wanted to hit, like stand back and look at it with them, right? right. So it's cool, it's a, it's a dream come true and uh, it's a great company. And the fact that they invest in a cult player like me and they, they help develop me, mm -hmm. um, and they're there for me, it says a lot about the company. Because Absolutely. I'm not Van Halen, I never will be Van Halen. That time is gone. Yeah. I love Van Halen, I wish I was Van Halen. That time's gone, yeah, you right. know? Uh, 100,000 records first week is gone. It's not happening. So it's different now. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're coming in and they're, and they're, they're picking up people like, uh, and, they're, and they're supporting people like Between the Barry to Me and, and, you know, and guys like me and these, these more kind of in-between genre guys and stuff like that, and proggier guys, mm -hmm. like that, that's huge and that's why I'm with them. Right, that's you so know? cool, yeah, that's man. so cool. So cool, and it's so cool that you found the instrument that really lets you express yourself. I thought I never I think would. That, I think that's a good lesson. That you know, the the whether it's the I think we have to let go of some of those preconceived notions sometimes. Yeah. That we have to have this to do this. When yeah. it, it may be something else that really opens the door for you. Be, being an instructor, I, I give the speech all the time. Uh, put your iPod down. You know, put your iPhone down. Shut the door. Lock it. Turn the phone off and mm -hmm. get at it. You know, because we're confused these days. You know what I'm saying? So I think that there will be an issue soon that we're not going to give birth to a lot of you know, genius people. That, I mean, granted, there's always art and there will be discovery always and technology and stuff, but I think the, the art form of the guitar, not fixing guitar and Pro Tools, but playing the guitar like right. Derek Trucks. Right. Computers can't do that. Mm -hmm. That's what you should be after, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's a cool thing. I never thought I would find my voice on the guitar, you know? Yeah. But, uh, but you're right, the preconceived notion, it's, it's good to have. And I, I'll tell you this, the most important thing in the world that you can't hurt or you're done is uh, your ambition. I, I, what did I call it? I called it like uh, uh, the fun factor. Right. It's like, it's a perfect balance of the fun factor and ambition. I can give a student a book of scales, but if I don't give them something that makes them have fun, they're not going to play. And that makes the scales worth nothing. Right. That makes everything worth so. You have to do things like uh, to trick yourself into playing. Mm -hmm. I walk by my guitar. I, well, lucky for me, I walk by my guitars, and I'll walk by there in the morning and I'll look at it, and it's like it just like I'm like a kid. I just turn back around, I walk over there. Ooh, I, I gotta play that. And it right. looks so nice. I'm gonna. Play. Sometimes I just sometimes I'll get caught by people staring at my own guitar. <laughs> 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 I swear. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's so. so great. <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming in. No man, sweat. It's such a pleasure to have it's you here. It's a pleasure, here. man. Absolutely. Nice to get a chance to, I could sit here and actually talk to you about the, all that stuff for, for hours. So yeah, dude, in any time. Catch you know. the rest of the, uh, the show here. So I'll be here all week, and absolutely. Awesome, man. Well, thanks. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute.